So these countries have always existed between greater powers. This fact is something which we must keep into in mind when we consider the euro, European expansion, the EMU expansion. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, the, you know, uh, most of the discussion that one hears about the euro, and I would say the standard economic analyst line now is that the euro will falter in some fashion. It will break up. I don't think many people have that opinion. But it will have to change because it is not a functional entity as it is. Now these opinions, and I've had this opinion myself, although as I'll explain, I am starting to change about this. Um, I was I was on the I did a uh, sort of a Q and A on this on uh, on Monday on Tuesday actually on uh, on CNBC here in New York, and I was really the only currency person on. I was the only guest on actually, and all of the anchors um, we discussed this for about five or six minutes, and it was very interesting. The standard view, which is has been my view as well, is that the euro cannot last in its current form. But the analysis that backs up this logic, and this, what you're looking at here is the, uh, I think this is the, the um, you know, I can never remember if it's a Lithuanian or the Latvian currency. Um, but as you can see, it's pegged to the euro. And I'll do the other one so that we can, this is, um, this is the other, this is the other one that is pegged to the Euro. Okay, so let's put those back. Okay. So the discussion always takes place about the euro along acad essentially academic lines. Um, you have a monetary union, but you do not have a fiscal union. You have a monetary union, a single interest rate, but you do not have a political union. And this is true. But, you know, I've started to realize in doing the research for this webinar that that is not enough of an analysis. It does not take into account the history and the position of the countries from Poland in the north down to Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary in the south that lie between the greater powers. And it does not take into account their view, their own view, of where they fit into the world and how they can best benefit from the things that are going on around them. So to take that into consideration, to put it another way, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and the effects that we've seen here on this, uh, the topic in currencies and very much in economics these days. Um, the, I think it's beneficial to view, and probably accurate, because to view the choices on whether to join the euro or not, or the choice whether to join the euro or not for these countries. And now I'm talking about Estonia. Now Estonia has already joined, but Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Romania. Let's see if I've forgotten anybody. Czech and the Czech Republic. Now, the other half of the Czech Republic, well, excuse me for anyone in Eastern Europe, I misspoke. The other half of what used to be Czechoslovakia is now Slovakia, and that is already in the euro. They joined, I believe, in 2011. So these countries, Lithuania and Latvia, Bulgaria, Romania, the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, are the ones who are making the choices. Their governments, and one would assume their peoples, 
will make. Now, all of these countries are already members of the EU. But let me, let me talk about the history of that in a second. I'm coming around to the idea that the much greater weight needs to be given, just like in currency trading. You don't only trade the dollar. You trade the dollar against the euro. There are two sides to that balance. You don't just trade the sterling. You trade the sterling against the dollar or the sterling against the euro or the Swiss against the euro. There are two sets of considerations involved in making your decision, involved in the market's opinion of what this currency is going to do. And it is the same in the decision, the process, the thoughts, the considerations of the governments and the people involved in these countries and whether to join the euro or not. The choice is not, and the analysis, the question shouldn't be asked, really, or it's not the right question to ask. Is the euro an ideally constructed multination currency? And the answer, of course, is no. Not ideally. But that's not the question that Poland and the Polish people or the Czechs or the Romanians or the Bulgarians are going to ask. The questions they're going the question they're going to ask, and the question their government is going to ask, and hopefully the governments will consult their people, if not by referendum, at least with very extensive public discussions. The question they're going to ask is, what are the alternatives? It's the same question that so many commentators seem to either avoid or forget or give very short shrift to when analyzing the troubles of the countries within the EU right now. And, of course, I'm talking about the southern tier, Spain, Italy, Greece, if you will, Cyprus, and Portugal. What alternative, and this is never examined thoroughly, and, and you know, I, I've, I've been guilty of this a bit myself. You look at what's happening in the euro, you look at the unemployment in Greece, so we're going to look at some of this, um, and we'll see some of the advantages of maintaining your own currency. Um, and you say, how, how, how can the people put up with this 27% unemployment rate, a GDP that's been down for five years? I mean, how do they put up with this? How does this affect their life? And I think there are two questions about, about it. One is the unknown and dropping the euro and crashing off into their own currency again is essentially stepping off into the unknown. And two, the official statistics in most of these countries do not provide an adequate picture of what's actually going on. Um, probably the unemployment rate officially should probably even be higher than it is in Greece, say, where it's about 27%. But as far as the actual amount of income that any family or anyone else might have, it's probably a good deal lower. There is a much greater ability within these countries and within these cultures, within these economies, and within people to manage than is officially portrayed in the statistics. And I've mentioned this before. I speak to friends of mine in Spain. And I asked them, how is this possible? How can there be 27 unemployment without a revolution? And the answer I always get, or 50% or more unemployment below age 50. And the answer I always get is that the, the statistics don't cover and can't cover the amount of work and unemployment that people can find aside from the official statistics, the black market, if you will, the gray market. Um, the people have a much greater capacity and ability to cope than are covered in the official statistics. Okay, so that's the background to the sort of the, the uh, sort of the intellectual background to the questions about joining the euro or leaving the euro.